Hello and welcome to our week 5 supplemental lecture on Ian Hacking's Why Ask What, which is a chapter in a longer work called The Social Construction of What. Hacking is asking, when we talk about notions of social construction, what this metaphor is meaning. It's frequently used as a metaphor to emphasize the extreme contingency of aspects of our practice or our belief or our experience. But in a more everyday context, when we use metaphors of construction, when we think about someone constructing a house, for example, we're not in fact skeptical about the materials being used to create that construct. You might be able to construct different sorts of things, but there are recognized constraints imposed by the materials themselves. No one worries about construction in that sense, having radical relativist implications. But we do worry about it when it comes to something like the science wars, which is the topic that hacking is reflecting on and that will be discussed discussing in class this week. So he wants to ask the question and explore here the different things that people mean by social construction and what is understood to be the construct and then how this plays out in the science wars. Hacking is an analytic philosopher by training so this article will make a lot of distinctions and try to be as precise as it can about its terminology but he's also someone who works a lot on historically transient mental illnesses, and also on the history of mathematics and why certain mathematical concepts, particularly statistical and probabilistic ones, are more intuitive at particular historical moments. So he's someone who sort of straddles the space. He's going to come down here in a sort of nuanced way, critical of certain concepts of social construction and endorsing others. And he starts off with this really, really long list of works. Uh, social construction, he thinks, is a, a fad concept. And so he goes to his library and he looks up a set of books, The Social Construction of X or The Construction of X, and he comes up with this enormous list that he rattles off at the beginning. And he says, talk of social construction has become common coin, valuable for political activists and familiar to anyone who comes across current debates across race, gender, culture, or science. But why? The existence of the debate can't be taken for granted. We don't always argue about these sorts of things historically. What's going on? And he says, well, on the one hand, it seems very liberating, the concept of social construction. It draws attention to historical and social contingency. And if there are things that you are unhappy with or don't feel satisfied with, knowing these things are contingent implies that there may be some possibility of changing them. On the other hand, not everything, just because it's contingent, is good and he talks about some of the things that he's worked on here, his notion of historically contingent illnesses. But he says the word is massively overused. He talks about it being cancerous. Uh, he says excessive use of a vogue word is tiresome or worse. And he wants to know why the idea has become so popular at this point in time. He's not going to fully answer that here. He talks about the vocabulary of wars that come out. We have lots of different kinds of wars. We have science wars, culture wars, history wars. And he talks about the Sokal hoax. You can read specifically about that. We've got Sokal reflecting on it as one of our reading options this week. And we also can see Sokal in the playlist of podcast this week, so you can hear a little more about that. But the short version is that it was a spoof article, a made-up article, sent to a journal that the journal published and that so-called then revealed was a hoax, was an attempt to show that you could sort of publish anything, uh, no matter how sort of much nonsense it was talking about science, you could get it published in the uncritical, scientifically ignorant uh, literary press, was the interpretation placed on it by Sokal and by many other scientists. There are other interpretations of it uh, by folks on the other side of the fence, and we'll talk a few about some of those in our other readings this week. But Hacking mentions it, and he mentions it in the context of all of these wars, and he says they often hinge on issues of race, gender, colonialism, or shared canon of history and literature that children should master, or so on. So these are not real-world wars. They're not military conflicts. They're cultural battles. And he says, these conflicts are serious. They invite heartfelt emotions. Nevertheless, I doubt that the terms culture wars, science wars, and now Freud wars would have caught on if they did not suggest gladiatorial sport. It is the bemused spectators who talk about the wars. <laughs> 
Okay, so there's a whole sort of industry of people watching on while these arguments and debates take place, and he thinks that this is why they get described that way, it's this kind of vicarious feeling of watching something uh, that is, that's violent and, and destructive. And he says, what are these things about? He says that people are afraid of something, that's the affect that's attached to these. What are they afraid of? And his language in here indicates that while he's going to take some of these fears seriously, he's not going to take them all particularly seriously. The language is sort of sarcastic or ironic in places. And so he says relativism seems to be the main thing people fear, and, and he says, what is this wicked troll? Okay, so this is not very serious language. And he notes that commonly the people who are suspected of relativism, accused of being relativists, insist that they are not haunted by it, they insist they're not it. And he talks about the exceptions, including David Bloor, that we looked at last week, and Barry Barnes, who's someone else in that space of the critical studies of science and technology. He also talks about Paul Farabond, we also read last week. He says, Paul Farabond of Anything Goes fame managed to describe some 13 different versions of relativism but this attempt to divide and rule convinced no one. Okay, so we've got some people who are happy to embrace the, the name, who are not bothered by it, but most people claim that's not actually where they're coming from, they're being misclassified as relativists. And then he says, I think we should be less highbrow than these authors. Let's get down to gut reactions. What are we afraid of? Plenty. And he says, we're afraid of a position that holds that all opinions are equal, that would license any sort of conduct. So we're afraid of the taking away of standards for judging other people's behavior, for enforcing kinds of behavior that we think are good. We're worried about undermining the criticism of oppression, and this will come out in a number of the readings this week, that worried that a particular kind of relativism prevents us from objecting when someone is doing something wrong. We're worried about historical revisionism, and he talks here about Holocaust denialism. He says, no one wants a relativism that tells us that such a book will, so far as concerns truth, be on a par with all others. We want to make judgments of truth, and if we can't, how are we going to be making statements that certain positions are false? He then backs up from this and says, as far as he's concerned, actually, this really isn't a debate that needs to be going on on the terrain of relativism or truth claims. It can remain a debate about the proper professional practices in the writing of history. He says there are fears about equating religious fundamentalism with science. He talks about fears of the decline of the West and multiculturalism, and then he backs up and he says, this is one fear I just cannot take seriously, and he points out that the province where he lives in Canada has had a government minister for multiculturalism forever, and he just can't believe that people are frightened of this, but it is a touchpoint, flashpoint fear. And then he asks what the point is of social construction. Okay, so we've talked about what people are afraid of. He raises the possibility that maybe we should try to define the word. But he says, actually, you can understand it better if instead of trying to define it, you ask what it's doing, what strategically people are doing when they invoke this concept. What's the point? And he says, a primary use of social construction has been for raising consciousness. This is done in two distinct ways, one overarching, the other more localized. First, it is urged that a great deal, or all, of our lived experience and of the world we inhabit is to be conceived as socially constructed. And he says, then there are the local claims about the social construction of a specific X. The point of a local claim is to raise consciousness about something in particular. Local claims are, in principle, independent of each other. You might be a social constructionist about brotherhood and fraternity, but maintain that youth homelessness is real enough. Danger is a different sort of thing from reality or women refugees. What unites them is an underlying aim to raise consciousness. So you don't have to say that everything is socially constructed to be a social constructionist about something. If you were talking about the social construction of something, you're trying to raise people's awareness of that thing, and specifically to raise awareness of it as a contingent thing that we have some control over and that we might be able to change. He says that the concept is overwhelmingly used to criticize existing situations. That in principle you could just sort of descriptively say that something is constructed, and there are some historians he thinks who does that who do that. But usually people who are using the term think that something is constructed and also not desirable. They're trying to change something about the status quo. 
And then he talks about gender and the analysis of gender as one of the places that this is particularly fought out. So he says, previous toilers in the women's movement knew that power relations needed reform, but many differences between the sexes had a feeling of inevitability about them. Okay, so they seemed natural. We've seen this already thematized in some of our readings when we talked about social movements. Then feminists mobilized the word gender, he said. Feminists convinced us that gendered attributes and relations are highly contingent. They also urged that they're terrible and that women in particular and human beings in general would be much better off if present gender attributes and relations were abolished or radically transformed. And he said, prior to this sort of discussion erupting, it wasn't at all obvious that gender should be considered something that was constructive. It wasn't at all obvious that gender itself wouldn't be determined by biological difference. So this has opened up the state of play. It's opened up things for contestation and debate. At the same time, this doesn't mean that all feminists position themselves in the same spot in that debate, or even that all of them think that the debate is the right way to go when contesting sex relations, gender relations. And he talks about four categories and attaches names that are sort of archetypal for the different positions. If you're interested in doing a paper on this issue, you might consider following some of this up. But he talks about people thinking of gender as an add-on to biology. So you have biology, you have sex differences, part of biology, but there are some extra social, cultural add-ons to that, and you can use the term gender when you apply to those. Then you've got a position that thinks of gender as a performative practice. This is a broader category than just thinking of it as an add-on to biological reality. There's a practice of embodiment as well as a practice of belief or, or extraneous kinds of cultural values. There are wholesale rejections of gender binaries or of any kind of politics predicated on the identity of being female. And then there are rejections of how prominent the category of gender has become in feminist theory, arguing that it's basically a distraction from what can be conceptualized as material struggles and realities. And some of these positions uh, can be more sympathetic to the idea that you might structure a politics that is somehow based on a notion of the feminine or a notion of womanhood, but you're focused on your material gains. Okay, and these are just some of the categories he lays out. There are others that you can look at. So what's constructed when we talk about something being socially constructed? And he uses an example here of an analysis of women refugees. And he says, on the one hand, this is an idea. It's a concept or a classification. It's not an individual idea. It's not just an isolated psychological product. It's socially shared. It has genuine material, not just mental consequences. So it's not just that people think about women refugees in a particular way, you can get a whole institutional and legal apparatus that interacts with women and processes them and moves them about and, you know, sort of hears them or doesn't hear them having real material consequence because of this notion of women refugees. So once someone's classified in a particular way, there's a whole apparatus of institutions that they interact with under that identity. And he says, if a category just on its face was really obviously socially constructed. No one would bother to write an analysis of how it's socially constructed. So he says, we don't usually talk about the social construction of people who flee their homelands because of war. It's obvious that there's a, an external contingent circumstance that's making people do these things, so there's no point in pointing out that it's socially constructed. But given that people are fleeing and that we've got other kinds of categories that we take for granted, like nationality and national borders and things like this, it can seem sort of logical, sort of natural, that by the time these people who are fleeing war-torn countries get to us, uh, they're just refugees, that this is a taken-for-granted status. And that self-evidence of the category prompts people to do analyses of how it's socially constructed so that they can say, look, actually we could be classifying these people differently and we could be behaving differently toward them as a consequence of a new classification. He says, in my example, the concept of the woman refugee seems inevitable once you have the practices of nationality, immigration, citizenship, and women in flight who have arrived in your country begging asylum. The author of a book on the social construction of women refugees is saying no. The concept and the matrix of rules, practices, and material infrastructure in which it's embedded are not inevitable at all. 
Okay, so that's the social construction of an idea category, women refugees. He says, but what about the social construction of, of objects, things that are not just ideas? And he talks about the self as an object, not the idea of a self, but the idea that the self is constructed. And he says there are a number of objections to this. Uh, there are objections that come from a philosophical tradition that emphasizes sort of individual self-construction through the exercise of free will that understands that you may have a social context in which that plays out. But since the notion of construction is one of self-creation, it seems almost uh, counterintuitive or, or impossible to have a notion of social construction. The thing that constructs is the self constructing itself. You get objections from religious notions that the self can be identified with a soul, and the soul is understood to possess an essence. And you can't talk about a social construction of that essence, although you may be able to talk about a divine construction of it. And he talks about social contract theory, and this idea that you have a self-subsistent self that is prior to society, either historically or logically, and therefore serves as a limit on society. And if people are coming from that framework, they may be quite politically nervous what might be at stake if you start talking about social construction because it can appear that you're taking away the limits on the state that the the individual self self-subsistent subject might be able to assert okay so if everything boils down to society how do we know that society itself is wrong and again events of the 20th century make this an abiding preoccupation how can we have a basis for judging an entire society that's that's violated human rights. Then he says you have people who are critical of the concept of a self-sufficient self, okay, critical of that sort of social contract idea, and they fall into two different categories. They fall into one category that's quite happy to take notions of social construction because they find it liberating, that it is freeing, because they think that the notion of sort of atomistic concepts of self does a lot of damage. So anything that can oppose that has a liberatory effect. And then you have people who just think it's nonsense. It's, it's sort of immediately factually, descriptively wrong to talk about a self-subsistent self. And it's so obviously wrong that there's no point in talking about social construction because this atomistic self doesn't at all appear inevitable and therefore it doesn't look like we need an explanation for where it comes from, it just looks inaccurate. And he characterizes this view as thinking that the self is sculpted out of biological raw material by the constant interaction with our fellow humans, not to mention the material environments our extended families and larger communities have made. And he associates it, and some of you who read Isaiah Berlin in past weeks will probably recognize this, with a very specific strain of the Romantic tradition. And then he talks about critiques, critiques of essentialism, particularly racial and, and sexual essentialism, where the term essentialist, he says, is often used as an insult. So people who want to claim that there is a, an essence of a race or an essence of a woman or an essence of a man, uh, this is not in terms of the phrase Hacking himself uses, the PC way to speak at this point. It's not really acceptable to take these things as matters of essence rather than as socially constructed. So in these particular spheres, there's a dominance of social construction, language, and self-understanding. And he also talks about critiques of universalism as another place where there's very heavy use of, self of, self of social construction of self-language. And he gives the example of analyses of the social construction of emotions. He says here, social construct is code for not universal, not part of pan-cultural human nature. Don't tread on me, he says, with those heavy, hegemonic, racist, patriarchal boots of yours. Okay, so it's an anti-universalizing move. And again, depending on the political register and the context that people are thinking of at the time, this may seem to be a very progressive position because it is anti-essentializing, or it may seem a dangerous position because certain forms of anti-universalism have fed into things like fascist movements. Okay, so people can be either very pro or very anti-concept of social construction depending on the political register that is most important to them.
And then again, a good analytic philosopher, he gives us some, some categories to classify different types of social constructionism based on different sort of disciplines and different political goals. He says that you can have a, a historicizing kind of social constructionism where you don't have to assess whether your socially constructed object is good or bad. You are just interested in how it's varied over time. Okay, there doesn't have to be any drive in this to try to change the status quo. You're just interested in the genealogy of a thing. Then he has something he calls ironic versions of social constructionism. So these are accounts that think something that's very important to us could have been very different. There are contingent reasons it is the way it is, but at the moment it's not really realistic to change it, so we can be aware of its contingency and it might be a bit amusing, um, but we're not really thinking in any short-term sense that we're going to be able to do anything about it. And although he calls this ironic and that emphasizes the humor of it, you can get sort of stoic, tragic versions of things like this. So any of you who read the Weber where he talks about the iron cage that we're stuck in now, this notion that for very contingent reasons, because a strange uh, religious movement springs up in Europe that has a particularly ascetic orientation to the world, that ascetic orientation has bequeathed to us a very strange kind of economic and scientific apparatus, and we're now stuck in that apparatus because modern industrial production requires it. There's nothing we can do about it. Weber's affect there is not at all ironic, but it is an example of the kind of thing that Hacking is talking about when he talks about the ironic mode of social constructionism. Weber doesn't at all act as though we could do anything differently, but he has a very strong story of the social construction of what we have. Then Hacking talks about various kinds of more critical, more active versions of social constructionism. He talks about a reformist approach that thinks that something is contingent, it may be very hard to change, but we at least need to try to mitigate its bad effects. He talks about an unmasking form of social constructionism that tries to strip whatever it's looking at, a false authority by showing the interests or the functions it serves. If any of you read the Bourdieu last week, that would be an example of this kind of unmasking social constructionism with reference to science and scientific competition and the appearance of disinterestedness, where Bourdieu argues that scientists may be disinterested about goals that are played out in other spheres of society, but they do in fact have their own interests and you can explain a lot of their behavior if you are cognizant of that. And then he talks about rebellious social constructionism that he characterizes as contesting its object in the world of ideas and then revolutionary social constructionism that's trying to actively transform social institutions that are doing the constructing. So you've got these various sorts of categories and you can often have people in multiple categories at different times, or you can have fields of study where different people in the field of study take up different positions. And then he says there are different types of things that can possibly be constructed, and some of them are more controversial than others. Some of them generate more debate than others. So he talks about, you can talk about the social construction of an object. An object is something in the world, or something that would be in the world if it were real. Okay, so you may not believe in the value of honor, but honor would be in the world if it existed, that sort of thing. And then he talks about ideas, which are basically classifications. The women refugee concept was discussed in that sense. And then he's got this phrase that he calls elevator words, because he says there's no other term that he knows of to group these things together. And what they do generally when people bring them up is they raise the level of discussion. So he's going to call them elevator words. And his examples are words like facts, truth, reality, and knowledge. And he says the words are used to say something about the world or about what we say or think about the world, but they're at a higher level. They are not in the world in the same way that Holmes, Greed, and Bailiffs are in the world. He says they tend to be circularly defined. They've had substantial changes in meaning over time that he says he's not going to talk about in this particular piece. But he says we can agree that a thesis about the construction of a fact is different in character from a thesis about the construction of the child viewer of television, which is one of the examples he'll go into. For it is not about the construction of either an object or an idea. 
One place we encounter the alleged construction of facts is in the sciences. What about the social construction of reality? That sounds like the social construction of everything. And this is, of course, one of the places where people start getting very, very nervous. What do you mean the social construction of everything? Surely there's stuff out there that has nothing to do with humans, that has nothing to do with our society, that doesn't care about us. We can't socially construct those things, surely. Can we? And he talks about the position of universal constructionism, and he says that this is very frequently criticized as a thing. Okay, so he says, the notion that everything is socially constructed has been doing the rounds. Okay, so he doesn't sound like he's too scared of this. And the reason he's not too scared of it is he says it's extremely difficult to find anybody actually doing this. So there are lots of people who argue against it, but finding someone who is putting themselves forward as a universal constructionist is pretty rare. He says, to, to be this kind of thing, we require someone who claims that every object whatsoever, the earth, your feet, quarks, the aroma of coffee, grief, polar bears in the Arctic, is in some non-trivial sense socially constructed. Not just our experience of them, or our classifications of them, or our interest in them, but these things themselves. And he just says, most constructionism is not universal. What would be the point of arguing that danger or the woman refugee is socially constructed if you thought that everything is socially constructed? So all these people from the big long list that he has at the beginning are all saying particular items are socially constructed. Implicitly, by the fact that they think it's worth making that argument, they must think there are things that are not socially constructed. So in spite of a huge discussion about social construction, he doesn't think anybody really is a universal constructionist. He thinks this is a a sort of a specter that lots of people are afraid has happened or is going to happen. And then he talks about the one thing on his list that looks like, from its title, it might be universal. It's Berger and Luckmann's The Social Construction of Reality. And he says, look, it might look that way, but it's actually just another local claim. It's looking at the construction of social meanings and our experience of objects. Okay, so it's still sticking very clearly to a bounded sort of concrete side, a local dimension of what can be said to be constructed. And then he gets into this example of the child television viewer and he tries to unpack it because he thinks that it illustrates some of the things that are specific about social objects and also about the complexity of dividing up the social world and distinguishing very clearly between ideas and objects in the social world. He's also going to try to illustrate the distinctions, the important distinctions between social and natural realities. So he says, you've got an argument that the child television viewer is a construct, a social construct. And he says, although children have watched television since the advent of the box, there is, it is claimed, no definite class of children who are child viewers of television until the child viewer of television becomes thought of as a social problem. Okay, you can think about this in a more contemporary reference in terms of things like you know, video games and the rest, so child players of violent games as a category of thing that some people think is a social problem, and so you get a, a flurry of work on it that produces a classification around that. The child viewers steeped in visions of violence, primed for the role of consumer, idled away from healthy sport and education, becomes an object of research. Putting it crudely, what is socially constructed in this case is an idea, the idea of the child viewer. Okay, so this starts off as a classification, as a category, as a concept, as something we think, an idea. But it doesn't stop there is the issue. Once we've got the idea and the classification, we can begin to build institutions around it. It can affect how people behave toward children, and that in turn can affect the children's behavior themselves. And then you start getting sort of like an object in the world, a child who is treated by other people as a viewer of television, and who maybe starts thinking of themselves and behaving more as a viewer of television in some kind of more substantive way. He says, since children are such self-aware creatures, they may not only become children who watch television, but in their own self-consciousness, child viewers. They're well aware of theories about the child viewer and adapt to, react against, or reject them. Studies of the child viewer of television may have to be revised, because the objects of study, the humans being studied, have changed. Okay, 
So it's not static. You can't study the social construction of a thing and not have that study itself impact on the thing. We are self-aware and we interact with ideas about ourselves, including criticisms of ideas about ourselves. And Hacking says, thus a social construction claim becomes complex. What is constructed is not only a certain classification, it is also children who, it might be argued, become socially constructed or reconstructed within the matrix. Okay. This isn't miles away from the sort of argument that Foucault was making in Discipline and Punish when we read that. He's talking about a specific social matrix that constructs people in a particular way that they can then internalize or resist. He's making a specific variant of this kind of argument. And Hacking says, look, so we've looked at this example and it seems to break down the distinction between ideas and objects when we're talking about social construction. So why do we want to make this kind of distinction in the first place? And he makes a few little jokes at his own expense as an analytic philosopher. But he says that actually the distinction can still be clarifying, that when people blur it, it can become particularly difficult for them to understand what the difference is between social construction claims about social objects and social construction claims about natural objects. And he returns here to the so-called hoax. And he talks about a particular response to the hoax that tries to say, look, the hoax was assuming that something can't both be constructed and real at the same time, but this isn't what the category of social construction is trying to do. Things can both be constructed and they can be perfectly real. And the person, Stanley Fish, who makes the response, gives two examples. One of them is about baseball and one of them is about quarks. And Hacking says, this doesn't work. Okay, this breaks down. It's not as illuminating as Fish believes that it is. The problem is that we all know that sports are socially constructed. They're made up things. We created them. They have a very short history. We know we make the rules up. We know how to revise the rules. You don't have to argue with anybody if you're going to say that they are socially constructed. Everybody gets it. But the idea of quarks is socially constructed. You have to be very careful about most people would be comfortable if you said literally the idea of quarks, our sort of beliefs and thoughts about them are socially constructed. We can talk about the history of how we came to discover them and that we didn't always know how to think about them and that the thinking wasn't quite right at various points and got interacted with experimental evidence and the rest. But that's different from saying the quarks themselves, the objects, the things are socially constructed. That strikes most people as a bit problematic. And then he finds someone who studies quarks, studies the, the scientific study of quarks, and absolutely insists that what he's claiming is not that the ideas are socially constructed, but that the things themselves are in a strong way. And Hacking says, I call this disagreement about contingency sticking point number one in the science wars. And far from wanting to sweep it under the carpet, which he thinks Fish has done, I want to make it a central piece of furniture in the parlor of debate. Unlike Stanley Fish, I do not want peace between constructionist and scientist. I want a better understanding of how they disagree and why perhaps the twain shall never meet. Okay, so he thinks that Fish, by blurring the distinction between idea and object, overlooks what the point of conflict is in the science wars. And then he talks about the differences between the natural and the social sciences. And we've talked about this quite a lot. We've talked about the distinction between natural and social as a kind of a pivotal distinction in modern thought. And Hacking's going to pick this up again. And he says, look, when you classify a person, your classifications interact with that person. And they interact with that person even if the person is unaware that you've classified them. So they interact not only because the person comes to know the classification, but they interact with the person because you can create institutions or other people can interact with them. Or there can be beliefs by other people or by the people themselves. But there are ways that people can become aware that they've been classified in certain ways. Inanimate things can't be aware of themselves or our classifications in this same way. And so it doesn't make sense to act like you can draw analogies between the social construction of social objects and the social construction of natural objects. It doesn't strike most people as intuitive. And Hacking says, the woman refugee as a kind of classification can be called an interactive kind because it interacts with things of that kind, namely people, including individual women refugees, who can become aware of how they're classified and modify their behavior accordingly. 
Quarks, in contrast, do not form an interactive kind. The idea of a quark does not interact with quarks. Quarks are not aware that they're quarks, and are not altered simply by being classified as quarks. There are plenty of questions about this distinction, but it is basic. Some version of it forms a fundamental difference between the natural and the social sciences. The classifications of the social sciences are interactive. The classifications and concepts of the natural sciences are not. In the social sciences, there are conscious interactions between kind and person. There are no interactions of this same type in the natural sciences. And then Hacken goes on to sort of try to spell out what he thinks the flashpoints are, the debates are, between notions of the social construction of science and of opposition to that notion. And he sits on the side, in this case, of opposition. Okay, so he doesn't mind talking about the social construction of scientific ideas, but he is not comfortable with the idea of the social construction of the objects that the natural sciences investigate. And he comments on the fact that because of where he sits, it's even hard for him to state what the opposing position is, because he finds it difficult to get his head around it enough that he can be sure that he's saying it precisely. So he gives that qualification, but he says he thinks there are three main sticking points between these positions. One of them relates to contingency. It's the point that he's just discussed. He says, a social construction thesis for the natural sciences would hold that in a thoroughly non-trivial sense, a successful science did not have to develop the way it did, but could have had different successes evolving in other ways that do not converge on the route that was in fact taken. Okay, so it's not just that people are a, a true social construction of, this, of science wouldn't simply say we could have gotten where we currently are, but by alternate routes. It would say you can have totally different routes, you can have totally different directions, you can get there in completely different ways. Where we currently are and what we currently think is the nature of physical reality is radically contingent. Okay, and he thinks that's what a, a strong social constructionist position would state, and he thinks there are some people running around out there that, that thinks they think they have the basis for that kind of position. And he says, neither a prior set of benchmarks nor the world itself determines what will be the next set of benchmarks in high energy physics or any other field of inquiry. I myself find this idea hard to state, let alone to believe. Then comes the question of whether it's a good idea, a true idea, a plausible idea, a useful perspective. Okay, so Hacking really struggles with this. He really has trouble thinking that someone can assert this as a serious position, but is aware that there are people claiming that this is their position. So he's struggling with it. He says the other thing that a strong social constructionism for natural science would involve is what he calls nominalism, uh, referring to a particular philosophical tradition. The idea that classifications are not determined by how the world is, but are convenient ways in which to represent it. The world does not come quietly wrapped up in facts. Facts are the consequences of ways that we represent the world. Okay, and again, he thinks that this is a difficult position to maintain in a very strong sense with reference to natural objects. He is more sympathetic to the idea that, uh, that there's some pushback from the natural objects themselves that informs our classificatory systems. And then he talks about stability, and here he picks on a couple of the people that we read last week. Contrary to the themes of Karl Popper and Thomas Kuhn, namely refutations and revolution, a great deal of modern science is stable. Scientists think that stability is the consequence of compelling evidence. Constructionists think that stability results from factors external to the overt content of the science. So it thinks that there are material interests that prop up science in its current form. And these are what he thinks the three flashpoints are of the science wars. And then he goes in conclusion to emphasize again what seems to him a sort of a fundamental and, and irrevocable difference between social construction of social objects and social construction of natural objects, which is that we have a reason to think that there would be these sort of looping interactive effects between our categories and stuff that we interact with in the social world. We don't really seem to have a reason for that expectation in the natural world, and so he has real trouble squaring up how someone could do a non-trivial social constructionist argument around natural science, which is why we've grouped him in with this set of authors this week on this side of the science war, even though he's someone who, in certain ways,
studies the social construction of apparently natural looking things like mental illness. Okay, but he regards those as classificatory phenomena and not as objects. And we'll see how the other authors this week take a look at this same thing.